On March 24, 2015, German Wings Flight 9525 plummeted out of the sky before crashing into the mountainside of the French Alps, sadly killing all 150 on board. Although investigators initially assumed technical failure, the actual reason behind this disaster was in fact much more sinister. And as it turns out, the monstrous actions were all plotted and played out by no one other than the pilot himself. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of German Wings Flight 9525. Now this is slightly different to my usual format today, but this case highlights the fragility of mental health, weaknesses in former airline processes, and our absolute trust in pilots. By the way, just to let you know, that I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here weekly, so if that sounds like a kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. And now with that said, go grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and sit back my friend. This is the case of German Wings Flight 9525. A famous author once said that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Now of course, this can be contextualized in various ways, but I like to think that Neil was talking about traveling. There is nothing more invigorating, wild, or fresh than broadening your horizons. And in fact, traveling to unfamiliar lands is considered to be one of humanity's greatest pleasures. We've been doing it for many millennia, searching with our feet to find our soul. And no matter where we start from, we always appreciate the contrast. Although this so-called hobby has been with us since the dawn of humanity, the ways in which we travel around the globe have become quicker, easier, and more sophisticated. Nowadays, our preferred mode of long-distance transport comes in the form of the aeroplane. Now, it's very easy to hop on a flight, take a seat, kick back, and not worry about our journey. And although more than 100,000 flights happen every single day, many of us still hold on to that inherent fear of disaster. It's daunting to think about this prospect, but technically, when flying in a tiny metal container about 38,000 feet in the air, your entire life is placed in the hands of the pilot at the front of the aircraft. And although they are vigorously trained and conditioned with years of experience, they are still, like the rest of us, just a human. Keep this in mind as we travel through this story. We begin our story today in the Bavarian state of Germany. Guten Morgen und Willkommen in Deutschland, folks. It's here that we find Andreas and the Lubitz family. Born on the 18th of December 1987 in Nürburg an der Donau, Andreas was born to his mother Ursula and father Gunther. His mother was a piano teacher, while his father was a corporate board member. Zeroing in on the life of Andreas, but there's not much to report on his childhood. He grew up in a semi-urban area, was a typical child, and had no issues with mental health. He did, however, develop a passion for traveling at a very young age, and often traveled with his family, visiting faraway countries such as Thailand. Moving to Montebauer at the age of six, Andreas attended Mons Topa Gymnasium. By 2007, he graduated with his Arbitur, Germany's equivalent to a high school diploma. Andreas's lifelong dream was to become a pilot, and at the age of 14, he joined the local LSE Westerwald Gliding Club, obtaining his gliding license just two years later. However, this wasn't enough to quench his thirst for the sky. Moving to Bremen to start training at the Lufthansa Air Traffic School, Andreas worked hard. And in the winter of 2013, after training in Arizona for several months, he finally obtained his pilot's license. Now, becoming a full-fledged commercial airline pilot is a huge task in its own right. It takes years of study and thousands of dollars and you have a long way to go, even after receiving your license. In fact, many airlines actually ask their pilots to become flight attendants for several months to gain holistic experience. And for Andreas, this was no different. After several months of work as a flight attendant, he gained experience as a co-pilot, gaining 630 hours of work experience in the Airbus A320. Now, interesting side note, but Airbus is actually where I started my own engineering career, and that experience was in the A320 family. First built in 1984, over 10,000 Airbus A320s have been made to this day. Being a single-aisle aircraft with twin engines, they are typically used for short to medium-range flights, and the standard model can hold up to 180 passengers. Although pilots can obtain training and fly multiple commercial aircraft models, it's normal for them to settle into one specific type, and for Andreas, that was the Airbus A320. Andreas had a very stable lifestyle. 
He was in a long-term relationship, lived in a comfortable apartment in Dusseldorf, and was a keen runner. Now, as far as adult life goes, he was doing pretty well. But this is where the cracks in Andreas's facade start to appear. Before going any further, it's important to highlight that depression, anxiety, and any other mental health condition can happen to anyone. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are, as we are all susceptible to it. But unknown to most in his life, and back in January of 2009, Andreas developed a severe depression combined with insomnia, which caused him to interrupt his time in pilot school. After thinking of taking his own life, and feeling the urge to jump off a cliff, he started to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist concluded that Andreas was put under too much pressure from his dad while growing up, and that this pressure forced him into a high-stress position. He was ultimately diagnosed with depression and anxiety, but neighbours and family friends described his parents as loving, understanding, and caring, especially after his diagnosis. In rather traditional fashion, Andreas kept a diary, and in this diary, he wrote about how senseless life was and how he wanted to die. January 2009. I want to get well again. Dear Lord in heaven, the past few weeks and months have certainly been the worst and most difficult of my life. Please help me. Give me the strength needed to banish these evil thoughts. To run simultaneously with cognitive behavioral therapy and relaxation techniques, Andreas was prescribed mirtazapine to tackle his depression. One of the possible side effects of this is, ironically, an increase in suicidal thoughts and tendencies. In parallel to this, he was also prescribed Zopiclone to treat his insomnia. By the early summer months of 2009, Andreas's mental health had significantly improved. His psychiatrist certified that he had made good progress, and even assumed that he would make a full recovery. And this, of course, was the news Andreas had been hoping for. With his flight training put on hold since January, he could now finally re-enter pilot school. And in 2009, after being examined by an expert physician working for Lufthansa, he was finally given the all-clear. To add to this initial approval, Andreas received another two declarations of approval to continue his professional training. He was officially allowed to have his license back and continue training with Lufthansa, albeit with a special permit highlighting his depression. Writing in his diary on July the 16th, 2009, Andreas said, I am so touched that tears well up in my eyes. Everything is actually fine again. Huge thanks go out to my family, especially my mother who saved me from the worst. I also want to say to my sweet girlfriend Catherine, who was with me through the darkest days of my life, and also never gave up hope, but thank you for staying with me. Fast forward five years, and now back to the point in time where he had finished flight school, but Andreas was in a much different headspace. Come December 2014, he formally requested Lufthansa to remove the special permit from his pilot license, and there was one very special reason for this. Andreas was becoming irrationally paranoid about his eyesight. He began to worry that maybe one day he would go blind, and even if he did marginally, he would lose his job and his license. He therefore wanted to get a specific kind of insurance for young pilots. If he were to become disabled, then they would reimburse him the 60,000 euros he had spent on pilot training. However, there was only one caveat. He was not eligible for this type of insurance, with depression listed on his permit. Despite his special permit condition being removed, Andreas's mental health was beginning to tank once again. His depression was on its way back and this time, he felt unable to open up about it to his employer. Doing so could risk his job, and that was the last thing he wanted to have. Doubling down on his deceit, Andreas then contacted his initial psychiatrist to ask for a letter. A letter confirming he has fully recovered from his mental relapse. And concerningly, he was given this letter with no further questions asked. By the early months of 2015, Andreas had sank to a newfound low. He began to feel burnout from his job, couldn't sleep anymore, and his paranoid behaviour related to his eyes had worsened. He began to notice little black dots in front of his eyes, known as eye floaters. And despite this being a prevalent thing with no cause for concern, Andreas believed that he was developing a visual defect, and ultimately, grew terrified of becoming blind. He was prescribed Zopiclone, a drug used to treat insomnia, but despite this, he still could not sleep properly. He then started visiting several doctors, some of whom he confided in, to admit his previous thoughts on taking his own life. To add to the Zopiclone, Andreas was also prescribed Mirtazapine, another drug used to treat depression. And a second doctor, who was unaware of this prescription, prescribed Andreas another antidepressant, known as Citalopram. 
It is speculated that Andreas visited a total of more than 40 different doctors in this time frame. But due to the confidentiality laws around medical visits, Andreas's frantic actions remained unnoticed on the medical radar. And, in fact, things would get even worse. On March the 10th, 2015, he was recommended by a psychiatrist to admit himself into a psychiatric unit, as he was afraid that Andreas was entering a state of severe psychosis. Despite being formally served with a notification of illness letter, Andreas rejected those orders. And rather than admit himself into a local hospital or call off work sick, he began to research ways to end his own life. Some of the results on his internet search history included painless poisons, becoming blind because of light and stress, overdosing antidepressants, death with petrol, and finally, cockpit doors. And this combination of stress, depression, deceit, and substance abuse would reach a deathly peak in March of 2015. March 24th, 2015. Welcome to Barcelona. It's 9.30 a.m. and German Wings Flight 9525 is preparing for takeoff. Looking after their passengers today, four crew members accompany their main captain, Patrick Soddenheimer, and co-pilot, Andreas Lubitz. With Andreas being 27 years old, Patrick was seven years his senior, married and with two children. And together, Andreas and Patrick worked to prepare their cockpit. Taking off at 1 minute past 10am, Captain Patrick Soddenheimer apologised for the slight delay. With clear skies and marginal wind, the Airbus A320 was likely to make some of that time back, taking a total journey time of around 2 hours and 20 minutes. By 10.27am, Flight 9525 had reached its peak altitude of 38,000 feet, and the flight so far has been entirely normal. At 10.30, Patrick told Andreas he needed to use the restroom. Andreas accepted his request, and said to Patrick, you can go now. Patrick replied, you are now in full control of this plane, to which Andreas responded with, I hope so, we'll see. Following standard protocol, but after Patrick had left the cabin, Andreas locked the door, therefore preventing anyone else from entering the cabin. But tragically, Andreas had disastrous intentions on his mind. Not even one minute later, he changed the flight's autopilot altitude from 38,000 feet to just 100 feet. The aircraft immediately began to descend, and with the speed changed and increased to 560 km per hour, it began to sink even faster. Meanwhile, and back on land, air traffic control noticed the abnormal change in location and altitude. They requested the pilot to return to 38,000 feet, but Andreas didn't respond. By now, Captain Soddenheimer had become very aware of the rapid feeling of descent. He banged on the door asking for Andreas to open up, but again, he did not answer. In just four minutes, the aircraft had plummeted more than 14,000 feet. Air traffic control desperately tried to contact Andreas, while the cabin crew frantically banged on the door. With evident changes to cabin security since 9-11, there was no possible way for anyone outside of the cabin to gain entry. And with the reinforced door with three latches, forced entry is almost impossible. Normally, Patrick would have requested re-entry to the cockpit using the aircraft's phone system. Andreas would then permit access using the lock toggle, but this time, it was ignored. In the case of an incapacitated pilot, the lock system can be overridden by entering an emergency access code on the external intercom. If the pilot makes no response within 5 seconds, then the door is unlocked. But in Andreas's case, he overrode the override sequence. And with this function having a 5 minute cooldown, they were all at the mercy of Andreas, who was in the cabin, breathing calmly. By 10.30am, Flight 9525 had dropped enough altitude to be level with the Alps. Andreas was flying dangerously close to the mountainside, so close that the right wing struck it. As the flight's intercom records passengers screaming and crying, the sound of metal can be heard against the door. We don't know what was being used, but Patrick was using either a fire extinguisher or a crowbar to break in. The aircraft's alarm rang throughout the cockpit, slowly and sternly exclaiming, Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. Master caution warning, master warning, played as the robotic backdrop to Andreas's calm, relaxed, collected breathing. And at 6 seconds past 10.41am, all of these noises ceased to exist. 
Flight 9525 had crashed into the mountainside. Crashing nose first into the massive Tetra Vichy near Prasot Briand, Flight 9525 was travelling at around 430 miles per hour. The aircraft and everyone on board were ripped into thousands of fragments in a mere fraction of a second. Debris was scattered across a quarter mile in both directions, with the largest items found being only as big as a couple of car doors. The local fire department, civil protection, rescue services and police were all dispatched immediately, but the crash site was almost impossible to reach due to its terrain. With the walk taking more than three hours, most personnel had to fly in by helicopter. It was immediately apparent that there were no survivors, and so the emergency rescue was called off. Salvage and repatriation began. A very grisly task lay ahead for all services involved, and nothing about this task was easy. For family and friends waiting at home, nothing but shock and despair awaited. Human remains were brought into nearby tents to be stored and identified through DNA analysis. Aircraft pieces were also collected, and authorities were determined to find the plane's black box. On March the 26th, two days after Flight 9525 crashed, Lufthansa's CEO, Carsten Spohr, addressed a room full of cameras and families. The black box had been salvaged and analysed, and information on what exactly happened finally came to the public eye. In this conference, Carsten said, We are saddened and in total disbelief that we have to announce that the aircraft was crashed on purpose by the co-pilot Andreas Lubitz. It is always important for us to select and choose our pilots and other employees wisely. Not even in our worst nightmares could we have imagined that such a tragedy would happen in our very own company. The flight's black box provided resounding proof that Andreas had decided to take his own life and 149 others in the process. After travelling to Andreas's home in search of leads, authorities found his notification of illness, his diary entries, and his online search history. Although it's clear how dangerous his mind had become, there was no sign of a farewell letter or sign of intent, only that he was gravely suicidal and had a lot going on upstairs. Toxicology reports concluded he had citalopram, metazapine, and zopiclone in his system. However, the exact dosages could not be measured or guessed. In light of such a tragedy, Lufthansa immediately compensated €50,000 per fatality, with a further €25,000 in subsequent months. More than €7.5 million Euros have been paid out since the beginning. And although some families have since complained about the handling of this case, Lufthansa has remained silent ever since. Lufthansa also made some rather cold statements back in the earlier days. One spokesperson for the airline justified their low compensation with, quote, The passengers didn't notice anything and were not in agony. And although the plane was sinking, flight service was still taking place. Now, such a statement was seen as incredibly insensitive. And although the black box recording has not been publicly released, the transcript is available online. Let's be very clear here. All passengers would have been filled with severe emotional distress. And even if we play along with the ridiculous assumption, but the service trolley would have rolled back from the steep decline. All passengers felt the rapid change in altitude. They heard the captain shouting and banging against the door. And finally, they would have seen the mountains coming closer and closer. All 144 passengers and five crew members were prisoners in their own seats, knowing they were likely about to die. So to the spokesperson who said that their passengers were not in agony, but in contrary, those 10 minutes must have been agonising. Manslaughter proceedings were eventually dropped, and the French court has since closed its inquiry into the deadly crash. It was concluded that no one could have foreseen Andreas's terrible actions. They also blocked any further legal action against the directors of German Wings, Lufthansa, and all of Andreas's former doctors. Since the disaster, German Wings has also changed its name to Eurowings, and now no longer acknowledges its former name. Now, it must be noted that German Wings, the Aviation Medical Service, and all of his bosses were not aware of the special permit conditions. This sort of thing was kept confidential by Andreas. Still, to this day, no one takes responsibility. Every doctor was tied to medical confidentiality, and Andreas worked hard to keep his health concerns secret. There are a few strange side notes to this case. For example, just one day before the incident, Andreas flew an empty plane from Dusseldorf to Berlin with another pilot. During this flight, they talked about 
and how before it, it was customary to leave the cockpit door open for passengers to say hello. Andreas didn't react to his co-pilot's statement. Instead, he returned home that very night and signed a living will document. On the morning of the incident, Andreas was spotted chatting and even joking with colleagues. He remained calm and seemed to be at peace. It was also noted that on his second last flight, Andreas briefly switched the altitude from 38,000 to 100 feet before quickly returning it to normal. This means that he rehearsed what he was planning to do. The man had plenty of time to change his mind. Tragically, despite being aware of the severe loss of life he was planning to take with him, he failed to change his monstrous mind. This is very different to my usual true crime videos. It is impossible to pay adequate tribute to the innocent lives lost that day. And it's hard to grasp how one man could single-handedly kill so many. 149 lives lost spread across 21 countries. 46 women, 80 men, 16 teenagers, and 2 infants. Included in the casualties were 16 exchange students. Out of a class of 40, only 16 spots were available. They were supposed to be the lucky ones on this trip. An opera singer who died was supposed to fly with his wife on this flight. Instead, she took an earlier one, leaving him on flight 9525. And sadly, her last words to him were, You can manage, you won't die without me. A pregnant woman was included on this flight, and behind her was a couple who had married a few days prior. A few days after the crash, a vigil was held in saint les Alps. While here, families let out 149 balloons into the air, one for each victim. And on the anniversary of this tragedy, families of the victims meet up in Le Venet and hike to the crash site. After this incident, the European Commission published a report containing several recommendations designed to help increase flight safety. This includes the principle that two people should remain in the cockpit at all times. Pilots should also undergo a psychological assessment before commencing flight service with an airline. And all airlines must now conduct unannounced random drug and alcohol screenings. Aeromedical data has also become more transparent. And airlines now provide low threshold support services for pilots with physical and psychological problems. While it's great to see that both mental health and security measures have been strengthened throughout this incident, it is sadly all too late for those on board flight 9525. It feels like I say this a lot, but hindsight is 2020. It's a lot easier to analyse and evaluate after the fact, but looking back, there were some glaring red flags to the process. I hope that all of those affected by this tragedy find peace in the future, and the very best we can do is learn from our mistakes. Other than that, I'm not sure how to wrap this one up. I mean, I do sympathise with Andreas's mental health issues, but his actions have firmly made him a disgraceful, selfish monster. Thank you so much, folks, for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. I really do appreciate your time. A huge thank you to Jana for helping me with yet another German case. With so much online speculation, pulling accurate information for this case was pretty difficult. As always, go on, you know what to do. Please share your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you found this case interesting, then why not watch some more? Now, as always, folks, I'll be back again real soon for another video. But until we see each other again, remember to look after each other and stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye. Oh my god, how am I gonna pronounce that? Massif de trois vichy ne prats haute blion. Massif de trois vichy ne prats haute blion. What is he doing? He's beginning to believe. Crashing nose first into the massif de Troisevichy near Prats Hauteblion. Crashing nose first into the massif de Troisevichy's near Prats Hauteblion. How? He is the one.